Can you see the leads lead yep. one there? Yes. All right, let me let me do one more thing. And then we'll do it again. All right, better. Okay, uh, again, thanks for the invite. I'm Or of W6BI. Um, live in Simi Valley, California. It's about 40 miles, I don't know, what's that, 70 kilometers <laughs> northwest of downtown Los Angeles. Been messing around with this uh, digital stuff for, I think it's about six years now. Um, some of the most fun I've ever had in ham radio, to be honest. So anyway, let's talk about, let me get a couple things out of the way here. Let's talk about modulation speeds, uh, modulation rates. Um, this doesn't have anything to do with throughput because if you remember back in the days of 56 kilobit dial-up modems, um, even with an ideal connection, you ra rarely got 56 kilobits end to end. And it's the same with every other digital uh, modulation. Morse code is about 50, max 50 bits per second. And as near as I can interpret that, that's somewhere above 30 words per minute. So that's, that's booking it right along. RTTY, about 50 baud, but that's not ASCII, it's five level baud O code. So it's a little hard to do a one-to-one -one comparison. Packet radio is 1200 baud and with the modulation rate they used for packet radio, that's one bit per second. And 1200 baud is 0.0012 megabits per second in modern measurements. It wasn't especially fast back then and it's gotten increasingly slow in comparison, but it's what we had and <laughs> we still use it. Uh, the various pack doors, one through four, are faster. Uh, pack door four is the fastest, around 5.8 kilobits per second. Uh, VARA is becoming uh, increasingly popular. Um, some of the guys are hacking on radios and signal links on FM and reported as much as 20 kilobits per second. So that's a significant improvement. But our Arden ham radio network links can be more than 100 megabits per second. In fact, the um, theoretical maximum on a 20 megahertz wide channel is 144.2 megabits per second. And again, uh, you'll only see that modulation right if you've got a stomp crunch signal between two nodes that are completely line of sight. <clears throat> so the the uh, ham network ham radio networking with Arden, they use stock wireless access point. There's no need to do hardware hacking anymore. And that eases the uh, entry level. Um, Arden now supports four, four vendors, Ubiquiti, TP-Link, Microtik, and GL.INET. Um, in the beginning, it was just Ubiquiti, so it's uh, expanded greatly. Um, we take these stock access points, we load uh, Arden software on them and poof, they become ham radios. And joined together, they create a ham radio TCP IP network, just like the internet, only not on the internet. So the software is derived from OpenWRT, which is an open source router software package, highly recommended by the way, if you're running uh, vanilla factory code on your router at home, your internet router, I highly recommend you investigate one of the open source router softwares, either OpenWRT, DDWRT, uh, there's one called Lead, and also Tomato. Um, they all keep their code up to date, far more secure and generally more um, features than the stock code. And again, they are all divide, uh, derived from Linux originally. So the Arden code supports the four brands of equipment I mentioned, and now over 70 different models. So there's, uh, there's several different uh, models to fit any situation. And four ham radio bands, at least in the US, uh, I'm not sure about Ofcom, we can talk about that. I mean, I have to apologize, it's, uh, this presentation is US oriented, so uh, 
we'll make some compensations where we can. Um, if you happen to be in an RF desert, um, uh, they've added RF or internet tunneling between nodes. And even if you don't have an RF link to start with, you can participate in the networking and uh, get up to speed on how it works. Um, part 97 only channels, uh, that's FCC part 97. Those are the ham radio channels, ham radio only channels adjacent to the 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz uh, ham band or bands. And the software now supports MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, which means two RF streams, two data streams. And 802.11n manages those streams. Um, if you're ever interested, go browse the uh, Wikipedia entrance on 802.11n the Wikipedia uh, page on this protocol, you'll be amazed at how smart it is at managing those two data streams. The software also provides uh, DNS and DHCP services, route discovery and routing information. And all of those combined together um, make it relatively easy to get one of these things up and running. You don't have to know a lot about um, about networking. Uh, other protocols like HamWAN, um, while well, they've uh, created a lot of scripts to support it, is just native TCP IP with all the routing requirements and stuff. And they even use BGP uh, in their network. So about the nodes, you kind of have to consider them like handy talkies. They're low power, um, typically around 600 milliwatts. Um, in a lot of cases, you can run less. Uh, a few of the um, Microtech run more. And they are definitely limited to line of sight. Um, in FM repeaters, you can get away with knife edge refraction, but not here. So these usually communicate like a handy talkie through a hilltop radio site. And also, because of the routing protocols and the link comparisons, if your node happens to hear two hilltops on the same channel, it will always choose the best one due to the routing algorithms. So we generally recommend a directional antenna over an Omni because the Omni will only connect with that best node. So <laughs> I found this uh, uh, image quite a few years ago and I've updated it. Um, and actually um, we can do better than now. Um, our best mountaintop to mountaintop link in Southern California is about 75 kilometers. That's pretty impressive, but still just one tree, um, strictly line of sight folks. So the ham bands that allow digital networking that Arden supports in the US are 900 megs, 2.4 gigs, three gigs, and five gigs. I'll talk about the, the last three uh, later. I'll just mention that um, 900 megs, while we have a ham radio allocation there, um, we only have one five megahertz wide uh, channel and we're secondary with ISM and every smart gas meter, water meter and electrical meter there is. So it's quite noisy. It's not used much in suburban areas. Some of the areas out away from uh, large populations do use it, but the gear is relatively expensive. You could get better performance with a five gig link nowadays. So you've built up this great network, but just like the internet, it doesn't do anything. It's about getting to some place where you can use something and they call them services. And this is just a selection of all the things you can hang on your ham radio network and use. Um, in the US, you can do anything you want subject to our part 97 regulations. And I'm sure Ofcom has something to say about what you can do with the network. And here are some examples of things we have used in the past. We don't use all of them currently, but I uh, thought I'd give you a sample. Um, communications hubs. Um, if you've ever used Slack at work or even not at work, Mattermost and Rocket Chat Rocket Chat are um, open source 
Slack wannabes, and they're actually quite good. Um, they allow text and pictures. There are multiple channels available. Um, in addition to having web access, there's apps for all of them for Windows, iOS, Mac OS, and Android. Very handy. So here's a screenshot of one of our Mattermost channels. Um, uh, the, the image there, uh, Eric, KG6WXC, and his family happened to be camping out in the high desert near Ridgecrest, California, um, last year sometime when a 7.1 earthquake uh, hit about 20 miles from them. They were out in the flat. They didn't uh, get harmed or anything, but it was quite exciting. And the next day, Eric drove over to the surface rupture and took a photo and shared it with us. There is no ham radio network coverage out there, but there was wireless coverage. And because we run two Mattermost servers, one on the ham net, and one on the internet, and they're linked together, he was able to share it with us while we were sitting at home on the ham radio network. So it can be pretty useful. And additionally, um, I saw it on my phone because I have the Mattermost uh, app running on my phone. So voice over IP, um, used to be everybody, everybody thought about it just for telephones and it's expanded since that and we'll talk about that. Uh, this is a, quite an old photo. This was pre-deployment, an old Cisco phone bought off of eBay for, I don't know, 30 bucks. And on the right is a Grandstream VoIP PBX, um, about $250 and it'll support far more simultaneous conversations than we'll ever need. And when we were deploying, uh, the guy doing the deployment was not comfortable yet with um, any open source PBXs like Asterisk. So he elected to buy a uh, off the shelf solution and it's worked quite well. Um, we've since deployed it. Um, you can see it in the red ellipse there. Um, this is the repeater shack on top of Sulphur Mountain, um, south of Ojai, California. It's about, oh, I don't know, 80 or 100 miles northwest of Los Angeles. Um, and by the way, that rack is completely full now. So because we bought the Grandstream um, PBX, we recommended people use Grandstream phones. Um, they're a nice phone and because of the same brand, um, it's pretty easy to manage them and push out firmware updates and the like. And you can see here that somebody called me, I didn't answer, I missed the call, and they left me a voicemail. And the PBX provides all the features you would expect of a, a PBX, uh, uh, conference calls, call forwarding, stuff like that. This is the second PBX we pushed out, not very impressive. It's a Raspberry Pi 3 running free PBX. This was deployed in the San Fernando Valley, which is the next valley to the east of us. Uh, the mesh network extends there and the two have been trunked together and combined between the two PBXs, um, uh, pushing 35 extensions, I think. Um, and just to comment, um, wherever we push out the mesh network to an emergency services site, whether it's a um, emergency operations center or a hospital, we push a phone out there. So collaboration servers are things you see the gamers use in the movies or on TV to keep their uh, teams uh, coordinated. Um, if you go to Wikipedia, there's a list of at least a couple dozen programs that will support collaboration. Uh, TeamSpeak, Mumble, TeamTalk. <laughs> That's my VoIP phone ringing. <laughs> Ignore it. Um, they all share some combination of voice and video chat, file sharing, desktop sharing, stuff like that. Um, we chose TeamTalk because it's one of the few that doesn't um, mandate encryption. I don't know about Ofcom, but um, there's this whole FCC thou shalt not obscure communications thing um, that we've been kind of told unofficially don't worry about for now. But at some point in the future, we're going to have to rationalize um, the FCC regulations. But for now, TeamTalk doesn't encrypt anything, so we avoided that whole issue. Um, features, chat rooms, as you'd expect, one-on-one -on -one chats, 
And again, you can set up as many channels as necessary. I'll show you that. You can use either the speaker and microphone on your laptop or a headset, typically a USB headset, highly recommended. And uh, unlike, uh, unlike your ham radio repeater, you don't have to wait for the other person to stop talking. Uh, you can interrupt him in mid conversation and it's much more natural that way. And when the links are good, the codecs will ramp up their uh, uh, encoding and you can get very high quality audio. Uh, this is not communications grade 300 to 3000 kilohertz. Um, and for those of us whose hearing isn't quite as good as it used to be, um, that's very helpful. If uh, you're talking to someone, you both have headsets on, it's quiet in the room, it's like you're in the same room together. It's a pleasure to use. The software supports push to talk. We generally use uh, on Windows, the left alt key or Vox or open mic. We have a, a weekly voice net on our server and I will close the doors to the office here, put it on Vox with my headset, put my feet up on the, uh, on the desk and just chat away for an hour or so. Uh, open mic is where you nail up a connection between um, two laptops through the server. And I, we don't use it very often, uh, but I could see an application if you had an emergency situation going like between a, a I don't know, a, a fire camp and uh, an EOC someplace. Uh, you put the laptops in a, a fairly quiet area, open the, open the mic, set up an open mic channel between them. And someone would come up and say, hey, I need to talk to Bill, is he around? And the other end says, hang on, I'll go get him. So it just says live. And one voice conversation typically uses about 30 kilobits per second. That sounds a lot compared to VARA or Packet, but um, across our county, which would be, I don't know, four or five hops and maybe, I'm trying to think, 50 kilometers, um, we typically get five to seven megabits per second end to end, just testing, not, not applications, but, but just you know stressing the network. So 30 kilobits is no big deal. We could support many, many simultaneous conversations. So here's a screenshot during a, uh, a weekly net a while back. You can see all the people logged in on the left. Um, when you're talking, the background of your call sign goes green and when you stop, it turns yellow, indicating that Dave, KM6FQ, was the last one to talk. And along the top, you can see there's a chat tab, a video tab, desktops, and files. And here's a, a, a net where we had everybody, uh, a few of them, turn on video. Typically, this is 640 by 480 or less at, I don't know, 10 to 15 frames per second to keep the, uh, the, the required bandwidth down. Um, video doesn't add a lot to a conversation, honestly, but we do this periodically to stress the system. Uh, when we did this, I watched the server, which by the way is a Raspberry Pi 3, and with seven streams going, it was 10% of its bandwidth and 10% of its CPU, and I think it was somewhere between one and a half and two megabits per second combined in and out of the server. So uh, lots of potential. Um, between the farthest northwest person here and the farthest southeast was about 150 miles, air miles, um, probably 175 network miles. I want to talk about this picture a little bit. Being in Southern California, brush fires have become kind of endemic. Well, they always have been, but they've gotten worse due to climate changes. Um, in September of 2017, I got an email from another tech specialist here in the section. He forwarded me a link on how to stream uh, webcams to YouTube. He asked me if I could uh, figure out how to use it because we might need it sometime in the future. Well, I took a look at it and I happened to have a test camera pointing at my house driveway and I got it working and showed him the stream and it was cool and I put it away. Not thinking that I would need it six weeks later. 
Well, he pinged me one evening and said, hey, we got a brush fire going near Santa Paula, California. Uh, we have a camera up on Sulphur Mountain, right? Said, well, we did, but different brand of camera, different model of camera, different, different operating system, but I did manage to get it streaming to YouTube in fairly good order, and this is what we saw. When we had been deploying the network across the county, um, cameras were not our priority. So this was a junker fixed direction, fixed focus camera that just happened to be pointing at the origin of the brush fire. Uh, the winds were howling that day um, and we watched that fire come over the hill and we managed to stream it for almost two hours before we lost electrical power at an intermediate point that had no backup power. Uh, after the camera went down, the fire came down the hill and that light in the middle lights up the owner's driveway. This is private property. Came down, burned all that, um, went right to left, east to west, in front of the tower about 100 yards away, continued west to the town of Ventura and burned hundreds of homes. It was um, disastrous. So. We learned some lessons here, battery backup everywhere we can and solar if we can. Um, this particular site had battery back, AC, battery backup and solar backup, but it went off the air after about 36 hours because the ash from the fire covered up all the solar panels. So um, you do what you can. Since then, we've ruggedized the network. Um, we're pushing out pan tilt zoom cameras everywhere we can, which is a good thing because 11 months later, we get the Woolsey fire. Um, this happens to be my valley, my hometown, Simi Valley. Um, this camera is on the north central uh, edge of the town and it's looking southwest. The Woolsey fire started about three screens to the left of what you see. Uh, hot dry winds blowing, blew west to east along the south side of uh, uh, my town. And where you see the flames there, it turned and burned down the hills towards the uh, towards the community. Fire department fought it off. It turned around and headed back south away from us. Continued south through the town of Thousand Oaks, burned several hundred other homes. Continued south, burned homes in Malibu and burned to the ocean. Um, we streamed this particular fire for 36 hours and we had hundreds of viewers. Um, the uh, other tech specialist, who pointed me to this, uh, the article on how to do this, is very much in touch with emergency communications um, and he has a large Twitter following because he always puts out alerts and stuff. And he had shared the URL on YouTube. And so we had hundreds of people watching this one also. Um, he relayed back that their commentary was frequently, they got better information on the fire from the camera than they did from the media. And here's another one. This was um, July of last year. Uh, this happened uh, down at the foot of the hill where the camera's based, one of the cameras. So uh, had fun streaming this one. If you look closely at the uh, center bottom, you can see uh, a few of the guys on the strike team that a previous helicopter had dropped off. This only been burned a few acres, but it was nice to be able to stream it. So another application is messaging or email. Um, you can use standard email servers. It's, it's just Ethernet, it's just TCP IP. Any SMTP server can handle it. Um, you could use Thunderbird as your client. And they also have web clients like Roundcube, which has gotten quite good. Um, I'll talk about the Citadel BBS, if you remember, if you remember BBSs. And there's also WinLink. Uh, WinLink, is a worldwide messaging system originally started for boaters. Um, originally, it only supported uh, ALE radios. These are uh, frequency agile radios, they're commercial radios, and they were quite expensive. Since then, um, WinLink has grown to support APRS, AX25, D Star, all the PAC tours, and all of ours. And they work quite well, um, and they're substantially faster than Packet, but in the past couple of years, WinLink has added support for Arden networking. As you'd expect, it's much, much faster and 
you don't have to worry about digipeding because the network routing knows how to get to the destination. Um, they're honestly kind of made for each other. Um, Winlink has a large set of standardized messaging templates. I'm sure they're different over there than they are here, but we have uh, whole uh, standard libraries of uh, incident command templates, uh, our USGS survey. <laughs> In fact, I used it the other day. I did you feel it uh, uh, reporting uh, uh, an earthquake uh, woke me up in the morning, 445 in the morning, just a tiny jiggle from where I was. So this is the Winlink architecture graphic you can find on their uh, website, has not been updated in a long time. Um, they've dropped support for Winmore, they've picked up Vara, and they've picked up RDOP. Um, by the way, if you're me messing around with HF Winlink, uh, I, I saw a, a, a test done last year with a um, uh, connection simulator, HF Link simulator that could throw in uh, fading and noise. And VARA did substantially better than RDOP. And in fact, in some cases, did better than PACTOR 4. So if you're going to do HF WinLink, VARA is the way to go. But for local stuff, the ham networking can't be beat. Um, you can move a lot of traffic and uh, you don't have the attachment size limitation uh, when you're forwarding via ham networking. So here's, uh, if you operate WinLink, this is nothing new. This is WinLink Express. It's the email client for WinLink. Um, more complicated than you would expect because depending on the destination you go, you have to kind of define the routing. And if you've got paths through VARA FM, VARA HF, or the mesh network, you know, it gets a little complicated, but it can be done. So here is a screenshot of me sending something to a post office server. And this one happens to be on the uh, local mesh network and is um, one, two, three, three or four hops away. So down here, if you can see my cursor, we moved 22.6 kilobytes of message and the total session time was 10 seconds. So that's, um, that's booking right along. If you guys are old enough to remember the days of dial up BBSs with DOS and modems, um, if you spring forward 20 or 30 years, uh, they've been webified and they're on the internet now. A Citadel is one of those all-in-one BBSs, email, calendar, contacts, chat rooms, everything you'd expect. Uh, runs nicely on a Raspberry Pi. If you had a group that was um, collaborating closely together, you could put one of these on there for them and they could maintain their project on it. Uh, works quite well. We tried it. Uh, we don't have any particular use for it, but it, it's, uh, it could work wherever somebody has a need for all of those combined uh, uh, features. <coughs> also, um, anything that requires an ethernet connection can be hooked together. DMR, DSTAR, ALLSTAR can be linked together. If you have two analog repeaters that need to be linked together, they do make hardware that will link all of the um, analog signals from one end to the other. Um, JPS communications makes them, SkyMira, um, they're kind of pricey, um, but you can get them fairly, say, less expensively on, on, on eBay and substantially cheaper than a pair of uh, 70 centimeter linking uh, repeaters to tie them together. Other things you can hang on there is um, if you have a, a, a weather station, you can uh, hang it on the mesh network. Um, this particular application is called WeWX. W E E W X. Um, it runs on pretty much any operating system ever written and supports hundreds of different um, weather stations from simple temperature link, uh, temperature sensors on up full to full blown uh, weather stations. I happen to use an altimeter 2100, and this is my station. I took this screenshot um, about an hour ago. And since it's open source, you can customize it. Um, I found this on the internet. Uh, this guy has obviously nothing better to do than customize his WinLink presentation. It's not on the mesh network, it's on the you know internet. But uh, 
again, he's running WeWX and um, had fun with that. It's not all about emergency communications either. Um, we've played with a Scrabble server. Um, tank works very, very well. You go around shooting each other up. And occasionally after the Wednesday night uh, Team Talk Net, we'll play a few rounds of, rounds of poker. Uh, this is the Texas Hold'em server. Uh, Eric, KG6WRC wrote a network mapping program. It's just called a mesh mapper. Uh, and it's open source and any number of people have um, uh, adopted it. And I managed to get screenshots of some of them. And if anybody out there has a screenshot of their mesh mapper, I'd like to put it in the presentation. I think there's probably three or four dozen mesh mappers running around the world now. These are all US, but um, they're a good example. This is a fairly new network up in Washington. Um, he's just got this established in the last 12 months. Um, well, I'll talk about that some more. Here's another one in the Salem, Portland area, west coast of the United States. Orange is five gigahertz. The purple is two gigs. The blue is three gigs. And what else do we have in there? The gray is no, no frequency. It's uh, uh, no RF links. I think the pink is uh, pink is 900, I think. Hawaiian Islands have gotten online in the last year. Um, they have a pretty good setup. They have a problem that every island is a mountain, so they have to go around the perimeter uh, or use tunnels. Um, currently, all their inter-island links are internet, but they're working actively at getting them on RF. I'm not sure if they're going to pick a packet or there's a, there's a 70 centimeter pair of ethernet modems you can get now um, a few hundred bucks a piece and they would obviously span that I think they can do three or four hundred kilobits per second here's Yakima Washington Eric uh, what's his name no Chad has done a good job in pushing this out in the last six months he's added cameras at the at the three mountaintops forming a, forming a triangle here with the orange ones and he's showed some screenshots. He can uh, cover his valley very well with those cameras. Here's the area of the Dayton, Ohio ham fest. Um, Chuck maintains this. It's uh, He's got it going. Here's the San Francisco Wireless Emergency Mesh Network. Um, this, net, this network didn't exist uh, 18 months ago. Uh, they've done a great job of deploying it. And here's kind of the big daddy, my network in Southern California. Um, we kind of had a head start. A couple of the developers um, live in Southern California. So we've been quite active. Um, in the area you can see there, which is, I'm trying to think, 265 air miles from Santa Barbara to the Mexican border. Um, and there's somewhere around 425 nodes uh, on the network that you can see there. Uh, some are hilltop, some are ground level. So let's talk about the equipment. Equipment supported by Arden for the four amateur bands. They're designed for outdoor use. They're weatherproof and they have power over an ethernet, which means you only have to run ca one cable up to the node. Um, the hardware inside these things is amazing. Um, it's terribly sophisticated. Um, and the vast majority of the ones you'd want to use have two transceivers. They call them chains. The combination of a transceiver and a modem is called a chain. So if you ever see that on the forums, that's what they're talking about. Um, most of them have built-in gain antennas, two of them for ver vertical polarization and horizontal polarization. And uh, the combination of MIMO and 802.11n is far better in terms of throughput than what we had previously. Um, <laughs> 802.11n can even take advantage of multipath to combine the data it gets. It's pretty amazing. 
uh, just a heads up, be careful buying used equipment. Um, the open WRT software and hence the Arden software is bumping up the thir against the 32 megabyte limit of some of the older gear. Um, so uh, while all the current versions of Arden will fit under 32 megabyte device, there's no guarantee that uh, uh, future versions will fit. And also don't buy something if it's not MIMO. If it has a single uh, end connector on it, skip it. And they're at least half as fast as a MIMO device. And also they don't mix well. Um, a MIMO device against a non-MIMO device works even more poorly than you'd think. And if you're not sure, um, Arden has flagged with a light green background all the devices on their supported device list that they don't recommend for new purchase. They're very handy. So this is, I never use this because I've refused to do this amount of hackery. <laughs> uh, I jumped on this as soon as uh, uh, Arden started supporting Ubiquity gear. This is an uh, Linksys um, WRT54G. And if you remember, I said that most of the modern nodes have 600 milliwatts of output. This has 60. And in spite of the two uh, uh, coax connectors on the back it was not MIMO. Um, receiver was nothing to write home about, not PoE. So, uh, and not 802.11.n either, it didn't support that. So good riddance. If you have a pile of these stacked up in a corner, find a door that needs propping open or even better e-waste them. So um, Ubiquity nano stations were the first Ubiquities that Arden started supporting. Their MIMO inside those boxes are uh, gain antennas um, somewhere between 11 and 18 dBi gain with about a 45 degree beam width. Um, work quite well out to about a dozen miles. Um, in the US, I would not recommending buying an N5, uh, an M5 now, and I'll talk about why later. Um, on the left, you have the ubiquity power beams for five gig and the 300, 400 and the 620 millimeter scare your neighbor size, uh, all work very well. Um, Arden started supporting the Microtech gear uh, it's been almost three years now, I think, LHG, LHG 5HP, and, and the XL, uh, all with varying amounts of power and gain. Um, the Microtech is very popular because it's light, very popular for your uh, the digital part of your uh, Go boxes. Um, the only caveat is um, we have some mountaintops here that aren't accessible six or eight months out of the year because they're frozen over, uh, iced over, snowed in. And the uh, plastic hex grid on the back of the um, microtech might not handle uh, icing up real well. TP-Link makes excellent products. I have an old CPE 210 first version that's still up and running. And they were all 64 megabyte devices uh, to start with. Um, I'm not recommending the CPE 510 like the nano station for the same reason I'm not recommending the nano station. I'll talk about that, at least for the US. If you can find the CPE 610 on eBay, jump on it. It's a very nice device. It's been replaced by the 710, but Arden's not supporting that yet. <coughs> so this obviously doesn't go on a pole outside. Um, this is a Microtech HAP AC light. Um, <laughs> one of the developers called this the Swiss Army knife of uh, ham radio networking. Uh, if you get on ham radio networking and you buy an RF node, you always buy one of these the second time. So you might as well just buy one up front. And here's why. Um, you put this in your shack. And the problem with the, the Arden network is it requires the 10.0.0 uh, subnet, uh, the, the network, and all of it, um, including the computer you've got plugged into it. So you got one on your home network in your shack, and then you got one on the uh, ham mesh network. So you got two computers in your shack. Um, this this eliminates the need for that. Um, port five supplies PoE and the device to device protocol that nodes use to communicate among each other on an ethernet. And it goes up outside to your 
uh, your node outside if you have one. Um, port one goes to your home network, which allows devices on ports two, three, or four to talk to both your home network and the mesh network. Um, this is where your VoIP phone would plug in, um, et cetera. Um, additionally, it's got two Wi-Fi radios in it, a two gig and a five gig. Um, the two gig, in addition to being a Wi-Fi access point or client, can be a mesh uh, node, although with an internal antenna, it's not very, not very efficient. Uh, the five gigahertz is an AC, 502.11 AC chip, and it's not supported for mesh networking yet, but it could be the five gigahertz access point where you could connect your laptop to it and not have to worry to plugging into it, about plugging into it. Or if you didn't have a wired connection to your home network, you could set this up as an access client and collect, connect to your home network that way. <coughs> a few examples, um, some home networks, uh, home mesh networks. Uh, this is K1GGS uh, here in the valley. Um, why does he have two nanostations up there? Because his access point up on the hill to the east of him has both two gig and five gig uh, user access points. So he's got a two gig and a five gig nanostation here. And if the he loses one of them or one of them goes off there on the hill, he's still got connectivity. Uh, we do this at every EOC and uh, other uh, government facility where we put mesh if we have access to uh, two different access points, two different mountaintops uh, or two different channels for redundancy. This is uh, KM6PTE setup. Um, I didn't mention it, but the nano stations are the only ones I think the TP links do too. Um, the nano stations have two ethernet ports, uh, main and secondary. You can, if you need to, run your ethernet cable up to the main port and configure the nano station to pass through not only power, but the network to a secondary node up there. <coughs> so you can have two nodes um, on your pole and only one run one wire up there. It can be very handy in some situations. So in the US, we have what's called HOA, homeowner associations that tend to be very restrictive about what kind of antennas you can put up. But the federal government here has mandated that they have to allow satellite dishes. So if you happen to be an HOA restricted area in the US, you can buy a Microtech light dish feed five and put it at the feed point of an old satellite dish and nobody will ever notice that it's not pointed at a synchronous satellite. And uh, Microtech makes an LDF2 if you need it on two gigahertz. So just like um, you probably wouldn't put a Baofeng handy talkie into use at a repeater site, most of the stuff I've shown you is more appropriate for a ground level station than a hilltop station. <coughs> this is what you typically put up on a hill for user access. This is a ubiquity 120 degree sector antenna and within that antenna are the two antennas, both vertically and horizontally polarized, both 120 degree. This has um, 18 to 20 dB of gain and covers 120 degrees of the compass as you'd expect. Um, clipped on the back there is a ubiquity rocket M5 and you can just kind of see the um, uh, two little coaxial jumpers going out there for the two chains, uh, vertical and horizontal polarized. This is typically what you'd put on a hilltop to cover your user population. If it turned out that 120 degrees would not cover your user population, you needed more, you would not use an Omni. You would use two of these overlapping on two different channels and you tie them together with an ethernet switch down at ground level, much more efficient. And you don't suffer as much from that hidden terminal problem we know about on packet. <coughs> So here's a typical, eh, call it a small site. Um, this is in North Orange County, which is, um, I don't know, 50 kilometers southeast of LA. Um, three nodes here, two gig, three gig, and five gig. They look larger than a regular node because they have RF shielding around the antennas. Um, additionally, the uh, rockets, rocket radios behind them have RF shielding on them. 
And they're all tied together with a network switch in the little green box down at the bottom. Um, this is a solar powered and solar and battery powered site. There is no AC on the site. And matter of fact, it's a quarter mile hike from the nearest uh, dirt road. Um, he has the pan tilt zoom, zoom camera there. Excellent camera, uh, very high zoom. I think it's 30X. The uh, little bullet camera there is pointed back behind us looking at the solar cells and batteries. Um, there's no telemetry, but he does have a thermostat, a thermometer, uh, outside thermometer strapped to the side of the battery case. And he can use that camera to see how hot it is up there. Here's a medium sized site. Um, this is one I administer. Um, on the container on the left, the yellow container, you can see a four pole for a UHF antenna and the Yagi is for the uh, link radio. Uh, the stuff on the left side all belongs to our county government, um, except for the small camera, that's ours. <coughs> on the top of the tower is an Omni UHF for a two meter repeater. And let's see, you've got three, four sector antennas. Upper left is three gigs for local site linking. Upper right, let me think. Upper right is two gig part 15 user access, commercial access. Um, the small dish is for a test network, hardly ever used. Um, lower left is two gig ham radio access. And the lowest um, sector is a five gig user access point. And the large dish, is our five gig uh, link on the county backbone pointed west. You can't see what's pointed east because there is some buried coax going up the hill to a larger site to an equivalent dish up there pointed east. And that dish pointed east talks to this dish here on the corner of this uh, container. Um, <coughs> this was taken after a windstorm. Uh, the HF vertical has since been repaired. And in spite of the impressive amount of antennas up there, only three or four of them are mesh. The uppermost three uh, are on our mesh network. Um, uh, five gigs pointing west, five gigs pointing south, and two gigs pointing west. And this mesh backbone continues east um, another, I don't know, 150 kilometers. So here's a serious large site. Um, this is a commercial site in Orange County on a site called Pleasant's Peak. Um, it's close to one of the main developers and the owner of the site is ham friendly. So Joe, the developer has had time to develop a relationship with the site owner and deploy this, all of these uh, uh, items you see in yellow, which are on the mesh network. What you don't see, which is below the photo are dish dish nodes uh, pointing at all directions of the compass for backbone links in all directions. This is a main hub on our network. So how can you tell if you can talk to a site? Because um, you really need to determine if you've got line of sight. You can use heywhatsthat.com. It's pretty easy to use. Um, Ubiquity's airlink.ui.com is easy to use. Uh, Radiofresnel.com is moderate. I found radio mobile kind of complex, but pe some people like it. it. Takes a while to set up though. So ham radio allocations in the United States. Um, we have three ham channels below. Well, actually we have from channels six down to minus two in two gigs. <coughs> One through six are shared with uh, ISM and Wi-Fi, and they tend to be quite noisy. Um, the Arden code gained the capability of moving down below channel one. Oh gosh, it's been four or five years now. Um, when we moved down to channel minus two, substantially quieter and uh, links that were only 75% previously were now 100% both directions. It drastically extended the range of the channels. Channel, that's the problem with two gigs. Um, uh, you can't split up your user traffic because uh, channel channel zero is not usable because apparently the software does not like a channel of number of zero. We don't use channel minus one in suburban areas because there are a lot of um, poorly designed part 15 unlicensed wireless devices that splatter way down. And we have use of the three gig ham band. Um, 
there's no uh, no commercial stuff in there, but the FCC in the U.S. has uh, ceded some of this to the 5G wireless carriers. Um, uh, channels 90 through 99 are going to go away early in 2022, and the other channels may disappear sometime in the future. So nobody's deploying three gig gear. Um, existing gear can stay up until we're told um, either move it or pull it down. Uh, I have, I don't know, several thousands of dollars worth of three gig gear here in the county and I'll be sad when I have to pull it down. Fortunately, it's all sitting on channel 88 here. So I'm good for a while longer anyway. <coughs> Here's the, the five gig ham radio channels in the US. I'll just talk briefly about that. Um, we can use them all. There's a lot of uh, Wi-Fi activity up there, especially on the mountaintops. Um, so we tend to prefer channels uh, 166 through 184. The problem is we have ATV receivers down around, uh, I don't know, 58, 80. And they are very, very wide and they get annoyed if we get anywhere near them. So it's a bit of a challenge. Over and above that, channels 166 through 184 says handband, but we're actually secondary to the Department of Transportation in the US. Some time ago, 10 to 15 years ago, FCC gave the DOT those channels to develop a vehicle to vehicle protocol. And they've been plodding along developing protocols and stuff. And the FCC finally got fed up with them and booted them out. Um, that's almost definitely gonna happen, even though there are a lot of government uh, facilities and automakers who are annoyed that they've put effort into developing uh, this protocol that has yet to see uh, the light of day. So what's gonna happen? The DOT is gonna lose that and you'd think that would be good news for us, but the FCC is going to let the Wi-Fi band expand, expand up to channel 184, the top of the band. Um, as that happens, we can stay on our ham channels. We belong there. But you'll find that the noise levels will gradually rise. That's why if you're putting out a new deployment of 5 gig in those channels in the US, um, I would recommend buying more gain than you need at the moment because you might find that the signal and noise ratios are degrading. And if you didn't buy enough gain in the first place, uh, you might have to upgrade. So where to get Arden ham radio network info? Ardenmesh.org, obviously. Software downloads, both production and nightly builds. And I would recommend using the nightly builds. They, um, um, they keep adding uh, new products, fixing little bugs, uh, small tweaks. Um, and it's good to get them out there and tested. Um, the last time I had to pull back a nightly bill because it had a problem was two and a half, three years ago. So they're pretty solid. They have how-tos up there, uh, FAQs. Um, Steve, AB7PA is his call now, took it upon himself to organize all the documentation out there into a wiki and it's, it's excellent. It's uh, soup to nuts. I recommend at least looking it over so you know what's in there um, if you have to decide and come back to it. Um, the Arden forums are very active. There's almost 3,000 members there. Uh, the Facebook group has about 1,400 members there. It's fairly active and you can ask a question there if you want. Um, on YouTube, you'll find a lot of stuff about broadband mesh. Um, there is an official Arden channel and there are a lot of others. The little asterisk, um, just use caution. If you see anything talking about setting up with Linksys, you can pretty much avoid it and nobody's using them anymore. Um, I, in fact, I would say if there's any um, mesh network related video out there that's older than two or three years, just kind of skip it. And it's like software, it's out of date fairly quickly. Um, I have a beginner's guide PDF. If anybody wants it, I can send you a copy. Um, it's like a summary of this presentation. And I also have a PDF version of this presentation that's <laughs> even more verbose. Uh, I've added in all the verbiage plus some extra stuff if anybody wants that. Questions, demos? I have a question. 
First of all, Ulf, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. And um, it's it's nice to see. I mean, I started off with Linksys just six, maybe seven years ago. And as you know, because we've talked before, um, I moved over to um, Ubiquiti and Microtech probably three years ago, four years ago. Um, so uh, it, there's a huge difference between the kit. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I've got plenty of doorstops in the shack of old Linksys, um, I have to tell you, but I would never, um, I would never think of using it. What we can achieve with actually relatively cheaper bits of kit. I mean, you look at the, the, the kit that we're getting is far superior at a fraction of the cost. I mean, it's especially Microtech and GLI net, um, you know, is, a, is yeah. amazing. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, if anyone's interested. It's like the, it's kind of like the cost of maybe three Baofeng handy talkies or something like that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And work better though. Oh, far better. <laughs> and Ian, did you want to say something? Oh, Roger, I, I just wondered, looking at the big picture in the amateur community, what would you say the take-up of this was and interest in it? And uh, how do you see its growth and future and all that sort of thing in terms of the community, the wider community? Who are you asking? Oh, you're asking. Me or, or? John, why don't you go? You know your local community other night. Okay, we'll do it together all first. Uh, someone's got some TV on. Someone's got a TV on in the background. Can't ask her. Oh, no. no, it's still got a TV on. Um, anyway, um, yes, well, I think um, <clears throat> in terms of over here, there's been a big move since the pandemic for um, district councils, a um, bit like your counties or um, to work with, um, to, to work with um, lots of different agencies, groups, charities, etc. Um, and, and I would have thought, and this is ideal for Rainet, because if you can remember back to the ferry um, capsizing um, off the Belgian coast, wasn't it? The town St. Torreson ferry, where those lives were lost. I do remember that some of the guys that I know were ferrying, oh, sorry, a bad choice of words, uh, using RTTY to transfer lists of names from the continent to the UK, um, which of course back in the day was quite good. And it did mean at least that you could pass names quickly and a lot of people wouldn't decode it because they didn't have the kit. So it made it more secure. Well, now, I mean, um, um, you know, people don't, these groups, I know, because I, I, I attend some meetings, these groups don't like um, the thought that things are going over on a secure airwave when you've got, um, uh, you know, you've got the, the, the services over here using more secure system. So <laughs> how long for, I don't know, but, um, so I think you've got more of a of a shoe in if you're saying that not only have you got a better system, you can use voice, you can use data, you can well, it's all data, uh, you can use um, live images, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, I think that's the way to go. So I, I mean, I know because I, I, I attend meetings at Kent County Council um, on, on emergency planning. Um, and I know that's the way they're looking. So, and, and I'm sure that's not the only um, county council or district council that's that's looking at it. So I think potentially if we sell it, if we build up the networks and we sell it, um, then I think it will take off. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a councillor on New Romney Town Council, which is like a parish council. And, and we're, we're hoping to use it as part of our... Um, uh, emergency planning and have it that's why i've got two um portable units uh which are on 2.4 gig um and their ubiquity uh nodes like awful was showing us on um so yeah i mean it's a bit like how long's a piece of stringy and so it's a bad, bad answer i'm not answering very coherently i don't think but um i think potential is there 
um, I think there is a people that want to have that sort of um, backbone, um, especially when they realize it can do everything that they could do on the internet if it was working. Um, and it's more than just, you know, because they think of Morse code, don't they? That's what they think of when they think, oh, those amateurs are coming again. They're going to be bringing their pigeons with them. And, you know, it's all. Um, so, so I think I think potentially it's there. And um, we're growing it. I mean, we've got a few people now, quite a few people in Ashford. We've got uh, two of us actively using it a lot in New Romney. Um, I host the, uh, as Orf knows, I host the... The, the other end of the international tunnel server at the moment here um, and a lot of people come in to, to me which is great because I've got bags of um, of uh, broadband so I've got I've got plenty to spare um, so you know it is it is moving it's a hell of a long answer and I'm so sorry but hopefully that gives you an idea that I think the market is ready for it it's just we've got to sell it Uh, comment. I, I was going to say, can I can I maybe just jump in there? Um, one one of the things that um, we've been doing up in the northeast. Um, again, it was it was something that uh, stemmed out of uh, lockdown um, because we couldn't attend the various uh, radio clubs, etc. We decided we wanted to look at something different. Um, I mean, there's there's always been a big um, a, a load of amateurs up here who've been involved with. Um, data communications, um, you know, primarily start with packet, et cetera. And uh, one, one of the things that um, we've, we've done is um, we've set up this group called NedNet, Northeast um, Data Network. Um, and again, unfortunately, it's it's generally been geeks who are um, uh, part of this, and I'll put myself into that bracket um, with being in the, uh, the IT industry. But um, we're, we're actually looking to try and get a link all the way from the Scottish borders, all the way down to um, uh, North Yorkshire um, the, on the coast. Um, at the moment, um, we're, we're all basically, like I said, I think I mentioned before, we're, we're basically connected up via uh, tunnels um, using various uh, ubiquity, Microtech uh, um, hardware and TP-Link and the GL stuff as well. Um, and we've only just really started um, messing around with the RF links. We've got the various services in place, uh, email, etc. cetera. Um, but um, with myself being the group controller for uh, Sunland Rearnet, um, and also with the, the business I'm in, I've got quite a, quite a few contacts with um, various um, organisations. So the um, local council, um, we had a, um, an emergency incident room um, in our local civic centre, which is at the moment currently getting moved to the um, fire brigade headquarters. So, as part of the move, I'm getting them to um, not only put up another uh, um, VHF UHF antenna, but also to run some uh, uh, Cat five, uh, sorry, Cat seven cable um, up the uh, up the mast at the same time. So we're a bit uh, future proofed. Um, um. I'm, I'm also I'm also having a look at the, um, yeah. the the local um, one of the local uh, social housing organisations who I used to work for, and uh, we're trying to get a, an antenna um, on the top of a, um, a multi-storey um, set of facts, which is which is probably about uh, sixty metres or so in height. So that would be quite good. Um, and and just for the the lads in the states, where I'm actually located in the northeast. We are um, a coastal site, so um, you know we're, we're probably only going up to about uh, 150 meters um, for the uh, the area that we're uh, we're covering um, in height. So we haven't got that many uh, mountains and things, and um, and I think if we put something up top of one of the uh, one of the big hills, um, I think one of the little uh, um, the the younger generation may go up there and uh, take it away. <laughs> and sell it on eBay or something like that. That's that's one of the things that we've got. But uh, it has it has started to take off a little bit up here. Uh, people are starting to get arrested. But it is as um, as you said, John. It's selling it. Mm. Um, that's that's a big thing. But I'm I'm also putting a lot on the back of Rearnet um, as you know to try and get into these various uh, organisations 
to start hosting some of the uh, uh, the nodes, etc. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Chris makes a good point. Needs to make a move. Oh, hold up. Um, right, see you later, Chris. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you made a good point, um, Steve, because, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to pass it back to Orv because I've heard this bit before. But Orv, when you started that fantastic California, I mean, you did it in 18 months, didn't you? I mean, setting that up, you, how did you get about, how did you go about getting support from the powers that be? Oh, and it wasn't 18 months. That's, what you're looking at is accumulation of five years of grinding hard work, honestly. Mm -hmm. okay. um, initially, most of it was self-funded. Um, and it really helps to make friends with repeater site owners and operators. If you can convince the owners and operators of a multi-site system that it's a good idea to have a radio network, radio network between them, your task just got a lot easier. Um, recently we've organized, um, a couple, a couple of groups have added nonprofit, uh, uh, groups supporting their activities. And in the U S, um, it's much easier to get grants and donations to a nonprofit because there are some tax implications and that, that has helped noticeably. Um, also set your limits, um. Uh, we support uh, Ventura County, um, my, my team, and it overlaps to the adjacent counties, but then we draw their limits in terms of uh, um, financial support. Um, they want it, they're going to have to donate, and, and they've done quite well. I give them technical assistance, and sometimes uh, I'll go out to another site, but when you have to drive 150 kilometers to, you know, power cycle a node, uh, that kind of, uh, you're not very enthusiastic about doing that. So we've encouraged uh, a lot of the um, mesh users to start their local support. And remember when it comes to emergencies, it's very impressive to see that map of Southern California, but is really irrelevant to my emergency communications in my county and adjacent because emergencies tend to be localized. Mm. So I worry a lot about the I worry a lot about the state of the network within oh a hundred kilometer diameter. Out beyond that, I'll help, but it's up to them to keep it running. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of circuitous. Um, we've had a lot of support from local um, uh, hams have been pretty much engaged uh, with emergencies here ever since the brush started burning. In other words, like forever. The AREs and ACS groups um, uh, pretty well coordinated with the local uh, fire department, uh, county sheriff, especially. Um, um, our ACS um, auxiliary communication services were actually unpaid county employees with security clearances and badges. So um, that's kind of a long-winded explanation. I don't know if it was helpful or not. Yeah, it was. Thank you. 